tell you love and if you're brand new to the channel here at ValerieLoveTV.com welcome I'm Reverend Valerie Love also known as Kaisi and I love talking about the marriage of money the nexus of money and spirituality so this is a new series we're starting on the channel and I'm so happy oh my god I am so happy so this show is gonna be over four weeks family you know how we do on the channel we have done 40 money mantras we've done 40 money spells we've done 40 money scriptures we've done tarot and your money 78 day challenge we've done 40 money secrets OMG we have done a lot with your money and wealth consciousness now we're going deeper we are going into Bitcoin and not just Bitcoin as a fad family it's not a fad not just Bitcoin as the latest hottest thing to talk about I've been talking about Bitcoin since 2014 not just um, you know it's the hot thing Bitcoin is nothing short of a means of providing of of, of um, I don't even want to say providing it's a means and a mode of bringing freedom and abundance to every person on the planet seven and a half billion people do we know what that means that's spectacular that's spectacular and that's what I love talking about I love talking about Bitcoin as a means of freedom and abundance for all when I first uh, started studying about Bitcoin in November 2014 when I first got orange pilled I got orange pilled by my higher self what does orange pilled mean orange pilled means that you were told about Bitcoin and so I've been able to orange pill a lot of people since I was orange pilled and I was orange pilled by higher self and how did that happen it dropped into my spirit during a meditation and you know what's very interesting about this whole thing I had seen that little bee bobbing around the internet you know sort of in the periphery you know how you say things in the periphery and maybe you don't pay close attention because you know I dismissed it oh, that's some gamer money what is that thing it's like a gnat that wouldn't go away you know like something fizzing in front of your face I didn't realize the universe was trying to tell me something when I studied it I couldn't believe my mouth was hanging open when I really dove into what Bitcoin really is what it can do how it works and what it means it, it's nothing short of astonishing so that is what I'm going to do my level best I'm going to do my absolute best to teach you in these next four weeks the show is going to be on four times a week Monday through Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time and when the show is not live because we won't be live on all of those uh, episodes when the show is not live we are going to add, I'm going to upload the episode and it will be available to you at 8 p.m. so Monday through Thursday this is Money Monday by the way happy Money Monday this is Money Monday and Monday through Thursday you will have access to this show and this show is going to take you through all things Bitcoin from beginning to where we are now and I've labeled it Bitcoin explained simply because that is absolutely what people ask for you know people are always looking for Bitcoin explained simply that's a big huge search term in keywords now before we go any further you must you must you must you must you must join me at our newest uh, masterclass the master class it's on the community tab of the um, of the channel and I'm also going to put it in the comments below and in the description below you have got to join us at the master class and it's also at ValerieLove.com forward slash Bitcoin you've got to join me at the master class coming up this week now and what are we going to be talking about in that class we're going to be talking about your wealth code yes you must register for the class and you'll see all the details go right now to ValerieLove.com forward slash Bitcoin and here is the class that uh, that we are releasing this week 7 7 at 7 the class is seven reasons why you're not rich yet and how to activate your wealth code now I have a question for you you've been meditating you've been praying you've done your candle magic you've done your rituals you've done your money manifestation you've done your affirmations you've done your vision boards you've done your envisioning you've done your visualizations you've done uh, mental movies you've done mantras you've done chanting 
why have you still not yet reached your financial potential now if you've already reached your financial potential no need in coming to this master class because you've already done it why haven't you and you're already successful of course you're successful you're successful to a certain extent you're successful you're able to see you see your manifestations getting bigger and bigger you know that you're you're getting there yet you still haven't reached your financial potential why not you still have not done what you know you can do why not wouldn't you like to know the reasons for that there are reasons and that's what we're going to tackle that's what we're going to take on in the master class so on this first episode of the show <laughs> the very first episode of the show this is what we're talking about we're talking about a brief history of money so that we can get the setup for this whole entire show and all the episodes that are coming. And when the show is completed, it will be a book. So yeah, it's gonna be a book. It's Bitcoin explained simply. Before we go into Bitcoin, we must understand a brief history of money. So that's what we're going to talk about right now. So I want to take you all the way back to, and I'm going to go much deeper into all of this when I have my slides in the master class that drops on 7, 7 at 7. Right now, I'm going to tell you a story. And this is a story of money. Where did money come from? How did we get to where we are now? Because in order to understand Bitcoin and for everything to be explained simply, you must understand money. You must have a very, very, very good working understanding of money, where money comes from, how money works, the financial markets, and all of that so that you can understand Bitcoin. And I got to understand money because I was a financial planner at American Express, financial advisor at American Express for seven years. And that was so magnificent because I got to work with so many clients. It was absolutely amazing. Now, let's go into this story of money. What is money? Well, money has many facets. And one of the facets of money is a medium of exchange. Well, why do we need a medium of exchange? Well, because you yourself, even though you're amazing, you're spectacular, you cannot produce all the things that you require in your life, right? So look at me today. Today I've got on these earrings, I've got on a scarf, I've got on a top, I've got on clothes, I've got on this, that, and the other. I'm speaking into an iPhone and I have these things around me, right? I myself cannot produce all the things that I require, right? So that means that I produce some things my next door neighbor produces some things. My other next door neighbor produces some things. You produce some things and we must hand these things back and forth between one another. Well, what is going to facilitate the smooth trade of these goods and services as well between humans? Money. Now, why? Because if I just grew some chickens and I have 20 eggs that I want to barter with you and you have peaches, and someone down the street has bread. And if we didn't have money on the price, we wouldn't have a good means of determining the price. We wouldn't have a good price signal because we would have to put next to the peaches the actual exchange rate for every possible thing that could be exchanged. So one peach could be two eggs or one loaf of bread. Or no, one, pe one peach could be one slice of bread, one roll, or it could be two eggs, or it could be uh, half a pound of string beans. You would have to put the price of every possible bartering um, product. That's how you would have to name the price. So the price had to be this long, huge thing because you would have to know what anything could exchange for anything else. That's inefficient. That's not efficient for markets, right? Hey, D, how you loving? How you loving? How you loving? So what do we have instead? They say we have money as a medium of exchange. So what are we going to do with this money? We are going to have one value, the dollar, let's call it. And we're going to denominate everything in this value. So a peach is $1 and maybe a plum is 75 cents and maybe a loaf of bread is $5. You see, it's a, me it's a unit of account. It's telling us, 
uh, it's giving us a price signal of the unit. It's a common unit all of us can use, and you always know what you can get for that particular unit, right? Hey, Lynn, how you loving? How you loving? Lynn, did you download the books for uh, for for numbers? Let me know. And please do leave reviews on Amazon. Reviews, reviews, reviews are wonderful. Reviews are wonderful. So we have cash, the dollar, the yen, the yuan, the rupee, whatever the money is. We have it as A, a unit of account, and B, a means of exchange, right? We're going to use it to facilitate trade. And we're also going to use it as a means of giving us price signal so that we understand what everything costs so we can buy it and we can have these exchanges with one another. another. Now, humans have always made money. Humans always make money. So it is very natural for us to make money. Money is a social construct. Now, now, pause and really consider that. Money as a social construct. What does that mean? Because when we get later into the later episodes here, and we're going to be talking about Bitcoin as a social, as a network, we can closely correlate it to money as a social construct. Now, if you go to give you a story about my kids. So my kids loved Halloween. Why? Because they got all this candy from everywhere. And, you know, we didn't let them eat candy indiscriminately all the time. So Halloween, Halloween was an exception. And they could get all the candy they wanted. Well, I would watch them after collecting all the candy, after, you know, their, their uh, trick-or-treat. And sometimes we had the neighborhood kids over, too. So I would watch them take out a big sheet, put it on the floor. Each person would dump out their candy in front of them. And then the kids are kind of in a circle, and you might have observed children doing this. They start trading with each other back and forth the candy based on what they like, what they don't like. In a few minutes of the children doing that, something very profound happens. A candy will emerge as money. What does that mean? It means that there will be a candy that is desired by everyone above all the other candies. That candy becomes the money. So, and that candy all of a sudden becomes more valuable than all the other candies because that is the candy that everyone wants. Now, it's very important to understand these concepts, and I love to explain concepts in terms of stories and real life uh, epithets that we can easily grasp. OK, get in that masterclass with me this Thursday and I'm going to give you the slides for all of this right now. And it's going to show you I'm going to show you exactly why you don't have the money that you think you should have. I'm going to show it to you exactly now. Let's say that the candy that emerges as the money is a Hershey's Kiss. Now, because the Hershey's Kiss no, 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 let's call it a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, even better. Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, because all the kids love it. Now, if you have a squirrel nut that all the kids don't love, they get stuck in your teeth, they're just like, mm, mm, mm. And, and one person has a squirrel nut, and one person has a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, which is the money, this is how it becomes the money, they're not going to trade you one squirrel nut for one Reese's peanut butter cup. Why? Because the Reese's peanut butter cup is more desired and it's wanted by everyone there. So they begin to measure the other candies against the Reese's. Well, that will mean that maybe they will, will, will require, no, you got to give me two squirrel nuts for this Reese's. Or maybe they'll say uh, three. So what is happening here? A group of children sitting on a sheet who just came back from going trick-or-treating on Halloween have just created a money in that social unit. And this happens all the time. This happens all the time. So if we go to prisons, everyone knows what the monetary value or the money of a prison is. It's cigarettes, right? 
it's okay. You, I do this for you. You do this for me. This is five cigarettes. This is two cigarettes. This is one cigarette. This is a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> right? It is going to be based on uh, whatever the person feels value is for the amount of cigarettes that they're getting. So what we are understanding about money, and this is a very, very, very important concept to understand about money. It is close. It's very social. It's very social. And it naturally emerges among people who want to deal with each other. Next, let's go to the next facet of money. The next facet of money is, is that it can take all different forms. And whatever form it takes, it usually is an agreement among all the people that are using that particular money. So now let's go to the Yappy Stone. The Yap. Yappies people. And they had a Ray Stone. And I'm going to go deep into this in the class. And if you don't have the class yet, the link is right below. Seven reasons why you're not rich yet and how to activate your wealth code. This class is going to go into deep detail about this. And I'm going to show it to you in slides. So we have the illustration. So, you know, it's much more than I go into in a YouTube video. Now, this particular stone was a ginormous stone. You couldn't move it. Well, it was a ginormous stone and it was agreed upon by all of the people that this stone had a particular value and therefore it acted as a form of money and it could be transferred to other people. Now, why was it such a good form of money? Because you couldn't counterfeit it. It was a big giant stone bigger than people. It had to be quarried from, I believe it was limestone, far away. And it was very hard to get. So, so this serves as the perfect money because it's very big, it's very heavy, and it's very hard to get. This, this makes it the perfect money. Sand could never be perfect money because we got too much of it. And you can go to any, any beach and get as much as you want. It can't be money. Right? Hey, don't you want How you love it? How you love it? How you love it? So, because this thing was so ginormous, so hard to get, so um, outstanding, so unusual, it could serve as the perfect money. Now, what about today's dollar? Today's dollar is no longer what we call hard money. Why? Hard money means it's hard to get it. So gold is the perfect hard money because, of course, it's not easy to get gold. It's rare. It's not finite. Now, Bitcoin is finite. Rare. Gold is simply rare. So with the gold, it's not hard to get. It's not easy to get. We all know you have to dig in the ground. You have to. It, it costs money, expenditure, humans working hard. You have to dig deep. You have to quarry it and bring it out. Then once you bring it out raw, it's still not ready. You have to melt it and smelt it, and you have to get all the impurities out. You, you have to take it through a process. This process is expensive. Therefore, when we get the gold, this gold is considered hard money. Because this goal was hard to get and it's not laying around everywhere. So the idea of hard money, just, just man, imagine that, just, just ponder that and consider that and ask yourself, is the dollar hard money or is it easy money? Well, the Fed is printing it every day. It's easy money. It's just printed, 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 printed. And this is one of the things that we're going to go very deep into in the class. The dollar is not hard money. The dollar is very easy. It's being printed continuously, continuously, continuously. Because we have hard money and we have not hard money, what happens to government when you have an ever-increasing monetary supply that is created by governments? Well, government gets together and they say, hey, <clears throat> We should have a program where we um, airdrop money to everybody. Okay. And it's $2 trillion. Do we all agree? $2 trillion. Yeah, $2 trillion. Let's do it. They go and they print $2 trillion and they airdrop money to everybody. Okay. Then they come up with another program. Yeah, we should have a program where we are going to just say no to drugs. Yeah, we're going to just have a program. And it's a trillion dollars. Do we all agree? Yeah, we agree. A trillion dollars. Let's go print it and just print it and continually fund all of the things that the government 
would like to do. And they could do that ad nauseum because there's no end to how much money they can print. It's, it's infinite. It's infinite money. Very cheap money, very easy money. You just print more. Now, this is Keynesian economics, and I want to say a little something about Keynes. Keynesian, you know, I've been studying Keynesian economics, and this man was, he, he was born into money. So he was already wealthy when he was born. This is the economics that we follow. And he spent a lot of his time in brothels of children. It's very, very fascinating. He's, yeah, children, brothels, just horrible. Uh, he spent a lot of time in children's brothels, and he was pretty much um, a hedonist. And no problem with being a hedonist; just be a hedonist with consenting adults, will you? You know that's that's the part that kind of just. Ugh. But anyway, he recommended this. This was his whole take on it. I'm going to give you Keynesian economics in one sentence, one word: consumerism. That was the answer to everything for Keynes. Consume. We need people to consume a lot of things. And where was this coming from? This was coming from a consciousness of consumption because he did not grow the fortune that he was living on. Someone else grew that fortune, his parents, his forebears. Well, when you have consumerism, the answer to everything in Keynesian economics is stimulate, stimulus, stimulate people to spend, spend money. What does that do? It means that people don't have savings. It means that people go into debt. And that is exactly what we have all over the United States and all over the world. We have rampant debt. We have rampant consumerism. And how much savings? The savings has continued to go down over time as gold was removed from the hands of humans uh, for the first time about 100 or so years ago. Really horrible. Gold was removed from the hands of humans. It was actually outlawed for you to even be able to own gold in the United States. And uh, after that, you just saw a continual down, downward spiral. Now, let's talk a little bit more about this Keynesian economics and how it's playing out. Because Keynesian economics is about consumerism, get people to spend, spending, spending, spending. You know, it's looking at housing starts and things like that because housing starts is a good indicator of how much people are spending because if you buy a house, you have to buy a washing machine and you have to buy a dryer and you have to buy, you know, um, all the appliances and you have to get the wood for the house and the this for the house and all that, build deck and all those kinds of things. Just this consuming, 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 consuming. You can understand that consuming equals what we call a high time preference. Please, please write that down. You will find all of this if you uh, like some books to study. I will give you a list of books to study. And if you follow the link below it in the description that takes you to my Amazon influencer store, you will see that I have books on wealth and money. And you got to understand this stuff, family. You have got to understand this stuff. If you don't understand this stuff, no way you're going to be wealthy. No freaking way. You might as well just kiss goodbye. They come in wealthy if you don't understand how this works. That's why I'm doing all these master classes and why I'm teaching about this because I'm, I'm stunned at how much people don't know about the very thing that affects every area of their life. Money affects every area of your life, right? Okay, so they want to continue this consumerism. What does it mean? It means people are consuming. We've already established people are consuming. People are not saving. People are... Um, and we have expanding government because government can just continue to expand itself because it prints the money and then it uses it for all of the government programs that it wants, you know, a program to check, see how clean everybody's house is. And they have a housing brigade coming around, you know, bureaucratic. There's no end to bureaucracy. We can have as many committees as people can come up with. So, and it would all be allotted for under the endless money printing. What is the, the opposite? The opposite, if we look at our history of money over time, we have gold. Gold was a sound, hard money, because as we talked about the hard money principles, gold was also better than silver because gold did not corrode. Because of the chemical properties of gold, silver could corrode over time, even though silver was very close to gold and it was used as, um, alongside gold. It wasn't 
as good as gold because over time you could have some corrosion in silver but you have no corrosion in gold because of its chemical compounds you have no you can't melt it i mean you you can't destroy it gold is indestructible you can if it gets in the fire it's gonna melt it's still there if it goes under the water it, it, it can't rust you know you have all these other metals that rust you can't rust gold you can't uh, disintegrate gold gold is gold so we can see over time that's why people held it in such high esteem and high value because it would hold this value and then people were the holders of their own wealth because they held their own gold do you understand that they didn't put their money in a bank do you understand that they did not say to people here hold my gold for me no People knew how to be the custodians of their own wealth. They held their own gold in their own means of holding it. They would secure it in a backyard or in a, a something they dug and hid in the ground or many, many, many ways they devised to hold their gold. Now, I want you to think about that because here lately, Please understand that just in the last 100 years is when people started saying, let me hold your money for you. And we had the, the explosion of banks. That was not the case previously. For thousands of years of history, a human history, people self-custodied. And I think about this, Bitcoin has you custody your own wealth not handed over to someone else, not your keys, not your coins. We'll talk about that in the future. So why am I telling you this? Over time, as gold um, began to be hoarded by governments, we came to the time where and, and, uh, gold was used as a backing because of course it was very inconvenient to carry around gold everywhere. So they came up with a great idea to have paper certificates, right? So you have a piece of paper. This is one of my books. So you have a piece of paper and this piece of paper represents this amount of gold. And that worked very well for a while because um, you could take your gold and you could deposit it with someone who could really take care of it. And they would give you these certificates and you would give the certificate to someone else and they could go and get the gold because the gold and the certificate were exactly even. Then we went to this uh, situation where um, nation states began hoarding gold, right? And remember, if you have your own gold, you can't be controlled because you are holding your own wealth and you have a hard money. So you can't be controlled by governments or any nation state. You're your own sovereign individual, which is another book that I would love for you to read called The Sovereign Individual. Anyway, let's continue. So here you have this situation where Okay, now we get a little paper certificates and it's back into gold. And then we move a little bit further and we move to war. Now, when we got close to the time of the war, World War I, governments got to see that they would not be able to fight these wars on gold. Why? Because there wasn't enough gold to keep fighting the war. You know, a lot of people thought that war was going to be over in the weekend. The war lasted for four years. Why did the war go on for four years? Because of funny money. Just print more money, pay soldiers, buy some more guns. Print more money, pay soldiers, buy some more guns. That's why I call the U.S. dollar and many fiat currencies blood money. Because this money is um, just created out of nowhere. And what is the backing of it? What is it for? Well, it runs a huge military industrial complex and nothing i'm not um, against the military i'm telling you that if there was no money to pay the soldiers just like in ancient rome you wouldn't have soldiers because <laughs> right? soldiers not gonna work for free and then just like in ancient rome you didn't have soldiers for free soldiers got paid very well they got paid you know spoils from the war and they like soldiers all along they get paid spoils from the war and they get paid land and they get paid just like now they still get paid land in the form of housing and they get paid money well if you didn't pay the soldiers the soldiers were not gonna go out and conquer your world just because you want them to voluntarily no no one's going to put their life on the line voluntarily you have to pay them or you have to give them some benefit or some reason for them to go and do that well fast forward to the gold was backed by 
the money was backed by gold. Fast forward to Bretton Woods. So the Bretton Woods Act. Hey, how you loving, Latoya? How you loving? How you loving? How you loving? How you loving? We we are getting our education on money. Don't play. Be in this in this whole entire series with us the whole time. Make it your business. We're on for four weeks, and during these four weeks, this new show is four times a week, Monday through Thursday at eight p.m. And when I'm not live, I'll be uploading the video and the video will be ready for you at 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday for the next four weeks and we're going to go through all of this in detail so you can understand what's going on and I pray you join us on one of our Bitcoin programs because in my master classes I have slides and I show you these things and then we have conversation about it because it's live on Zoom and then it's recorded of course for uh, all those who cannot be present if you register for the course you always have access to everything because we give you the recordings of everything. So right now, if you if you register right now, you can even get our past master classes that I've had. The link is below. Now, we fast forward to Bretton Woods. And what is Bretton Woods? Bretton Woods is, well, after the war, the United States had a whole lot of gold and most of gold. They had a lot of gold, just a lot of gold. And so what is Bretton Woods at? Bretton Woods, they got together, all the countries got together and said, well, since the United States has so much gold and they know how to take care of the gold, they know how to secure the gold, right? Because remember, gold has to be secured. It's not like... Um, it's not like digital money. Well, digital money has to be secured too. It's not like uh, something um, digital. It's, it's secured in a different way. Gold had to be physically secured, of course. So the United States had all this gold. And so what did they do? They made an agreement with all the other countries, major superpowers, major powers around the world, not even superpowers, major powers around the world. They made a deal that said, hey, we're gonna have the gold and uh, we'll secure the gold and we'll even hold the gold of other countries. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, denominate foreign trade in the U.S. dollar and the U.S. dollar is backed by gold. And so everybody said, yeah, that's a great idea. We're, we'll do everything, you know, globally uh, as the U.S. dollar trade as U.S. dollar backed by gold. And so all the nation states will peg their dollar to the United States dollar, not dollar, their currency to the United States dollar, because the United States dollar, US dollar, was going to be backed by gold. Well, we know what happened. That didn't last. So it didn't last. And eventually, over a couple of decades, you know, it really started in the 60s. And then in 1971, the death now, President Nixon, because things were just going out of control and printing, printing was happening. And what was happening? Some of the countries even showed up. France even sent a, a ship to, uh, I think it was New York or somewhere, um, asking for their gold back. Like, put all our gold on our ship and we're going <laughs> to take it back home because no longer was the dollar one for one with gold. There was money printing, so it was starting to inflate and you were starting to get one dollar of gold, but two, three paper dollars. So... It was starting to be a problem. So in 1971, we understand that the President Nixon took everyone off the gold standard, right? Took the money off the gold standard. Then, since then, you've just had a free for all. Family, if you do not, if you do not take action on your finances, I'm telling you, Mad Max is coming. This whole thing is going to blow up one day. We just don't know when. And I'm going to tell you what to do about it because I'm not a doomsday prophet and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not. I'm a real logical gal. I like logical things. I like using critical thinking skills. I like looking at world events and coming to my own conclusions. I like studying. I like reading tons of books. So I'm just offering you start making your moves. Now, some people have made their move where they're on 30 acres in a nice cabin in the woods. And they have three years of food and water in the basement and they got tons of guns. Now that's not exactly my way of going about it. I mean, however you want to go about it, it's completely up to you. Something big is coming. Something big is coming. And family, I've told you so many times, so many things that have happened. And I'm telling you, something big is coming. Okay, so now off the gold standard, money printing like crazy. Well, what happened? Well, 
along the way, we had to have the birth of the petrodollar. So how did the petrodollar work? And to kind of understand, I'm, I'm giving you the, like the Cliff Notes version of all this. There's a whole lot more behind the scenes, but I'm giving you a simple history of money, just a little story, just so we can be ready to understand the Bitcoin experience, right? When was the birth of the petrodollar? Well, the United States, because that's what we have now. Right now, we have what's called the petrodollar, the dollar backed by oil. Forget about gold. Now, the nation states just hoard gold. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you about the part in there where they did uh, confiscate all the gold from, <laughs> from all the citizens. It's illegal to have gold. Give us your gold. Okay, you got to turn in your gold. Is that crazy? I mean, let me tell you something. If I was sitting on gold back then, you would have had to cry it out of my dead cold hands, okay? I would not have given up my gold. Anyway, let's continue. So they made gold illegal for all the humans. All the nation states start, you know, just hoarding, 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 amassing gold. Because after all, it is real money. It is hard money. Well, later on, we had the creation of the petrodollar. What is the petrodollar? The petrodollar is the dollar basically backed by oil. Why? Because of the United States making an agreement with Saudi Arabia that all the oil must be paid for in dollars. Now, every country on the planet practically needs oil because they need oil for the raw ingredients, right? It's the raw materials, petroleum. I remember back in the day, I used to work at this petroleum company. Petroleum was like a, a, a base ingredient for a whole lot of things that people make, for plastics and all kinds of things that people make in goods and services. Uh, goods, not services, goods. So because everybody needs oil, petroleum, that the United States made a deal with Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia that they would only sell oil to anyone in the world for United States dollars. So now every country pretty much is captive to the United States dollar and whatever happens with the U.S. dollar because they have to get oil and the only way they can pay for the oil is to pay for the U.S. dollar, pay for it with the U.S. dollar. This has been the reason why the U.S. dollar has been able to maintain its, its global dominance even though it is not, it's not a good currency. It's not. We have something better. Okay. So that's our petrodollar. And if you want to understand really a lot more about this and about how countries like, if you think about El Salvador and why they adopted Bitcoin as their currency, it's because a lot of these smaller countries, especially in Latin America, that are very rich with resources, they basically were raped and pillaged by the United States um, by making these big, ginormous loans to them from the uh, IMF and the World Bank and uh, Inter International Money Fund, uh, Monetary Fund, IMF, and the World Bank. And if these large, com if these countries, wherever oil was discovered or something, you know, some great resources were discovered, if these countries didn't make the deal with them, they would just knock off the president. Now, this is not me making up shit. Read the book. Confessions of an Economic Hitman. I think I'm going to link it below as well because I made a video about it too. The thing will blow your mind. It was an economic, they call them economic hitman, hitmen. And their job was to go around and get these countries on the hook for huge loans that they know they couldn't pay back. They would, they would definitely default on the loan. And when they defaulted on the loan, of course, the collateral was all of these things in the country, um, natural resources in the country. And then what would happen? Well, the U.S. would then own all those natural resources. Basically, the U.S. would own the whole country and all of their resources. Well, don't you think, do you think people are going to sit around and let that happen forever? Look up the book Confessions of an Economic Hitman and you will see and be able to understand how this plays out. Now, let's go further. Because we now have these countries that are in debt, hugely in debt, we also have com countries that are, um, you know, kind of, just devalued currency like Venezuela, Argentina, Zimbabwe, now Nigeria. Many of the countries where the currency is now devalued, they are just having a runaway inflation that has not yet occurred in the United States yet. Oh, it's on tap. Do not think that we can have endless money printing and not have to pay the piper at some point. Now, these are the things that I want you to take away from in this conversation. One of the things that I want you to take from is the concept of hard money. The other thing that I want you to take from this conversation is the concept of money as a social construct.
Another thing I want you to take from this conversation is the progression of money over time and how it is a very recent phenomenon that you have been able that you have given up your money to third parties when for thousands of years people held on to their own money as gold. Another concept, so this whole custody issue, another concept that I want you to consider is inflation and what happens every time they print more money. The money that's in your wallet gets smaller, smaller, smaller. The next concept that I want I want you to think about, I know these are a lot of concepts that we covered and it's important. It's important to cover these concepts. Another concept that I want you to come, that I want you to consider um, before we conclude is how does Bitcoin factor into all this? How does Bitcoin solve these big, big, big problems? We have some very big problems on the planet right now. And if we don't solve these big, huge problems, we're going to be SOL. So you've got to think about where am I going to put my money? Because the money is continually going lower and lower and lower and lower and lower in value. Where am I going to put my money, my energy of today? That's what the money represents, doesn't it? It represents your energy that you went out and you traded in the marketplace and you received money for something you did. You had output of your energy. Where are you going to put the results of your energy output, where are you going to put it so that it does not dissipate into nothingness, therefore keeping you on a treadmill of having to work, having to work, having to work, having to work. I remember I was watching, I'm going to end with this. I remember I was watching a video of a sister who had moved to Mexico. Now I moved to Mexico also, so it was very fascinating to me and I travel all around the world, so it was very fascinating to me. And this is what she said. She said that she was working and she was working and she was working and she realized something. She was on, she was retired. She was on social security and her pension her, and she had, I think, some investments. And she had this money coming in. And she said that in order to be able to make ends meet or to live the kind of lifestyle that she wanted to live, she had to work. And she said one day she came home from work and she was tired and she said something. She reminded, she, she realized something. I am never going to stop working. Now think about that concept. If you do not have substantial investments or a place to put your hard earned money, your energy that you put out today and you received energy in return in the form of money, if you don't put it somewhere, you can't keep it in the form of money because you just quickly go broke. If you don't put that energy yield somewhere, you gonna work forever. That's not an acceptable option for most people I know. I'm sure it's not an acceptable option for you either. Who wants to do that? No one wants to do that. So what I am giving you is nothing short of a means to free yourself so that you can not work, experience financial freedom, experience wealth, experience the time to sit back and read a book, go to the beach and lay on the beach and not think about money, travel the globe in whatever way you want to travel the globe, get on a plane and you know, I was just in Peru and then soon I'll be in Thailand and Bali and Tokyo and uh, Vietnam, Vietnam. You know, uh, we got Mexico coming up for the Wealthy Goddess Retreat coming up, go to ValerieLove.com, click on Global Events. We also have the wealthy. Um, we have um, the wealthy goddess is coming up in Thailand also at the end of the year. So it's going to be about your books and becoming very wealthy with books. At least financially independent. You can be. You can become financially independent with your books. You've heard me talk about that before. So the bottom line of it is, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to do something dramatic to create massive wealth. I'm not talking about just be comfortable. I'm talking about massive wealth. I'm talking about stratospheric. I'm talking about far beyond your wildest dreams because the universe has it available to you and you can have it. Far beyond what you might have ever dreamed possible for yourself. You know, I just want to expand your vision. I want to inspire you to go for something so much bigger, so much better than what you even think you can do.